the last message from this chart. <laughs> um, and then also tomorrow, um, I've got Michelle Finch. She has read uh, three messages on God's eternal purpose and the distinctions between the New Covenant and the New Testament books and the original uh, uh, editions. And those are going to be grouped together as an audio book that I'm going to release tomorrow. Um, so look forward to that. Uh, and then I'll probably revise the New Testament, New Covenant book eventually to include all this stuff that got developed. And what I think is amazing is that you can know when you're on a path of truth in God's word because it always becomes more and more and more. There's always more ways to approach it, more ways to see it. You keep seeing it and seeing it and seeing it. Um, whereas human arguments peter out after saying two or three different things. <laughs> and then they end up repeating themselves. So, like, you can tell when you're dealing with a man-made ism because you see people saying the same things, uh... And that's predictable what they're going to say. But when you are discovering truth from the word, everything becomes new. You start to see something and then the word just opens up. I didn't know I was going to give, what, like 30 messages on this? It's been totally edifying. I'm not trying to win an argument at all. This has just been my enjoyment. So it's like, you know, people came against it, but that actually drove me to pursue it even more and I'm even more clear now and yeah I prayed I there were times where I was like okay there's this many people getting upset what is this a wind of doctrine what's going on you know it's like no I didn't launch this uh there's no way I could have arranged for this to become uh such a big thing God shined a light on it because he wants us to see it and he wants to develop it real clearly, you know. And uh, so praise God for all that. Um, but the last point in the first chart is that the church is raptured to the heavens before the Lord. Uh, and the Israelites are gathered at his coming. So the church has a secret rapture because everything related to the church is a mystery, including the rapture and is not anticipated in the Gospels. Every time you see the Lord talking about watching for his coming in the Gospels, he's actually talking about things related to his coming openly to establish his throne. And to that end, he's going to gather the elect from the uh, winds of heaven or from, from the east and from the west and gather them to his... Uh, feast right literally from the all over the earth they'll be gathered not up to heaven but to the earth and you know it's funny the people who argue with this position won't argue with that because they want there to be a pre-tribulation rapture so they'll argue that oh yeah the you know matthew 24 25 that's for the jews that's talking about israel that's talking about their kingdom that's not the rapture you know but then uh when it comes to actually putting Israel in their land, which is the purpose of the tribulation. They don't want any part of it. Not because they were against it but before, but because they have to reject that if they're gonna if they're gonna say that they are under the new covenant. So they're backing themselves into a corner by insisting that the church is under the new covenant and taking it away from Israel then you take away, you dissolve all their promises and all their distinctions, which takes away the kingdom, which in turn takes away the hope of the rapture. Because the rapture is to get us out of the way so Israel can be grafted back in. And it takes away prophecy watching. It takes away why we know that Israel is in the land. All that stuff. You, you got nothing, you know, except dreams and visions and the vaccine might be the park, mark of the beast. <laughs> so... You really unravel the prophetic word. Now, I'm not saying in every case. Again, some dispensationalists, mo a lot of dispensationalists, teach that we are not under the new covenant in its ultimate fulfillment, but we partake of its moral blessing because of the Spirit. Um, 
And like I said, as long as they're not backloading works into the gospel or fruit inspecting based on new covenant provisions, and as long as they realize that the new covenant really is for Israel and Judah, and it's related to them being in the land for their kingdom, then I don't have a problem with it because they're not allegorizing the word. But once they start doubling down and allegorizing the scripture, taking away from Israel and putting it on the church, uh, that now they're more in the category of Jews who, uh, that those who say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Um, and Jesus mentioned that in the church of Philadelphia, you know, he said, I'll, I'll make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but do lie, worship before your feet. And that's what we're dealing with. The main thing about what legalism is, is that it comes from blending the church's distinctions with Israel and dissolving those distinctions and putting the church into the spiritual living that's really for Israel. That's where legalism comes from. In the, and that's called syncretism. That's Galatian error. Uh, and that's been a problem all through church history, and it's really a gospel issue. Um, so, okay, the next little chart was the character, characteristics of living, of mortals, under each situation. Each of these situations is for the living of mortals. It's an administration for mortals to live under. And there's the church, and there's Israel in the land during the millennium. Uh... And that's really where it gets important. And that's why I'm concerned with it. Is because... it is it interesting just prophetically? No. It really has an impact on how you view the Christian life and how it's lived. Um, so I'm just going to go through these comparisons. And I'm not going to dig at it too much because I've done so much. Um, but first of all, the living of the church is governed... By edification from the New Testament ministers, stewards of the mysteries of God. And that comes from 1 Corinthians 4 1. Let a man so uh, count of us as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And the mysteries of God are what we've been talking about. The, mi the ministers in the New Testament ministry are stewards of these mysteries. And when Paul gave us the autobiography of his ministry in. Um, Ephesians 3, he talked about how he'd been given a stewardship um, of a revelation of a mystery that had been hidden from the ages past, the mystery of Christ, which is the church, for the fellow heirs, for the heirs. And it, he had the unsearchable riches of Christ um, to distribute in this stewardship. So... When Paul talks about the stewardship, he's talking about an inheritance. And we know, and that's why we don't say New Covenant ministry, we say New Testament ministry. The New Covenant ministry, it doesn't exist. There is no New Covenant ministry where you can become a New Covenant minister because Christ is a mediator of a New Covenant with Israel. you got nothing to do with that. Uh, but you could be a New Testament minister being a steward of the mysteries of God and New Testament, as we said, the precedent is in Hebrews 9 where it says, because the death of the testator has occurred, we have a testament. And it's the same Greek word as covenant. That is true. But it's clearly talking about an inheritance, a will that's been passed down after the testator died. And Christ is now the mediator of a testament as well. And that's why we call it the New Testament. And the New Testament ministry is the stewardship of the mysteries that have been revealed concerning Christ in the church, which is our edification, our food, our nourishment, our supply. And that is what governs our living. What governs the church's living? The New Testament ministry. The ministry of the apostles. It's called the ministry of the word. In contrast, Israel has a living that's governed by God himself directly. Ezekiel 31, 33, uh, oh no, it's Jeremiah, I messed up. Um, we can do this. 
They shall no longer teach every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of the greatest of them. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Now, the, if you back up the verses immediately before that, i got to hurry because i got to put my kid to bed, but... Uh, This shall be the covenant that I will make. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and that be their God and they will be my people. Um, and then it's Ezekiel 26 that says that I will cause them to walk in my ways. And I'll put my spirit in them and cause them to walk in my ways so that they keep my statutes and my judgments and do them. And they will not depart. They will not backslide. And there's scriptures all through the minor prophets and the major prophets about this new covenant he's going to make with them to betroth them to him in righteousness and keep them. Again, we're talking about mortals. In resurrection, there, everything's perfect and finished. But when you're a mortal, you're being perfected or you're being governed by an administration. And for us, that administration is the dispensation, same word, of the grace of God given to the Gentiles by the revelation of a mystery which produces New Testament ministers who are stewards of the mystery, for, which are an inheritance for the children in a New Testament ministry versus the covenant that God makes with Israel. So that, because to stay in the land, the Palestinian covenant they have to be holy. They're heirs, but to enjoy the inheritance, they have to be holy. And for that, they couldn't keep the old covenant, the law. So God made a new covenant with them where he himself will keep it on their behalf in them, which is glorious. So we have New Testament ministers with a stewardship. They have God himself directly and it's not that we don't have God himself directly, but God is imparted in Christ through the New Testament ministry. Again, how do you know anything about Christ? Well, because of the preaching of his witnesses in the New Testament. The Gospels and the Epistles are that ministry. They minister Christ to us as our food and drink. And they were handled, the riches of Christ were handled by stewards. And what we have in the New Testament writings is an, a description of Christ as our inheritance handled by stewards who dispensed him to us. Okay, so the church has apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints that were given as gifts to the body for the perfecting of the saints unto the work of the ministry. What ministry? The New Testament ministry. Um, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some shepherds and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up, the building up of the body of Christ. How is the body of Christ built up to be the bride of Christ? Through the New Testament ministry. And in that ministry, there are the stewards. And those stewards are gifts to the body. They are apostle, prophet, shepherd, teacher, evangelist, right? And their job is to perfect the saints in the knowledge of the mystery of Christ in you and how it's lived out. And then the saints are the ones who do the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ in love through the fellowship. And then it says, until we arrive at the unity of the faith, the full knowledge of the Son of God, and of the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So there's three things that the ministry produces eventually. It produces a unity of the faith by declaring Christ. And then we come into the full knowledge of the Son of God. Now, in the New Covenant, he says, they don't need anybody to teach them to know me. They'll all know me from the least to the greatest. But with us, we have a ministry from the gifts given to the body to perfect us all until we come into the full knowledge of Christ. Uh, and then unto the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ, that is talking about how we are being built up to be the habitation of God in spirit. See, when we know God, we're filled with God. He's actually brought into us as a weight of glory. The New Testament ministry far exceeds anything else as far as 
you know, we talked about that in Second Corinthians, that it dispenses Christ as a weight of glory to be wrought into us. And right now we don't see that weight, but we walk by faith, right? But when this earthly tabernacle is dissolved, the weight of glory which was wrought into us as we grew to know him uh, will shine forth. And that will be our distinction. We will shine like the stars in the heavens. That is a different kind of spirituality than the New Covenant. And in that sense, it's higher. It's more profound. It's an eternal weight of glory. It's a glory that far exceeds any other glory. It's Christ himself. It's the knowledge of the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ in our hearts. But it's handled by uh, and dispensed in a New Testament ministry, which is the ministry of the Spirit which gives life. And that, honestly, is what the dispensationalists really don't know much about. They just, there's not seminary teaching on the New Testament ministry and 2 Corinthians spirituality. That, you really have to go to the inner life folks. Um, but it's fine, you know. We do, we have what we have today, which is wonderful. We have the dispensational teachings and distinctions, but we can go further because we also are standing on so much recovery of truth related to the life of Christ and how it works in the body for the building up of the body and what is the actual New Testament ministry. Once you see what the New Testament ministry is, you no longer think you're under the New Covenant. It, it just breaks it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, in contrast, uh, there's no teachers in the New Covenant. They'll all know them. I'm, I'm wrapping up here. Um, instructions to deal... Okay, so the church has instructions to deal with the heart and the mind. See, in the New Covenant, God keeps their hearts, and they will be kept from all defilement. Ezekiel 14, 11, for example... The house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people and I will be their God, says the Lord. They won't be polluted anymore. God's going to put an end to all the transgressions. And again, the first fruits of that new covenant kind of living is the 144,000. There's not a lie found in their lips, right? They're virgins. They've not defiled themselves. They are completely holy through and through. Um, those are the first fruits of that group. But we have a different kind of situation where we still have more of a mixture, but our spirit has been regenerated and what's being wrought into us is more glorious. And what we have is not God just sovereignly keeping us so that we don't transgress, but we have a process called transformation, which happens by the renewing of our mind. Now the heart is the mind, will, and emotions. And we are told many times in all the epistles what we need to do with our heart and with our mind which wouldn't need to be necessary if we were under the new covenant uh, Ephesians 4 17 and 18 this I say therefore in testifying the Lord that you not henceforth walk as other Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind having their understanding darkened being alienated from the God, life of God through them because the ignorance in them because of the hardness of their heart it's possible as a gen as a church member a regenerated believer to walk that way it's called a carnal christian uh colossians 3 1 if you be risen with christ seek the things which are above where christ is sitting at the right hand of god and it says set your affections on things above and not on things that on the earth beneath for you died and your life is hid with christ in god uh we're to set our affections in our mind above. Um, 1 John 5.21, little children, keep yourself from idols. right? And we know from Revelation uh, 2.20 that Jezebel has influenced the church and seduced his servants to commit fornication spiritual and eat things sacrificed to idols. The church is full of false prophets and apostate people who are genuinely believers but they are caught up in every wind of doctrine because they have not been equipped by the new testament ministry and for the most part have rejected it a lot of times because they say i don't need a teacher we all know god from the least to the greatest they borrow from the new covenant to stay in ignorance um but in contrast god will keep their heart in the new covenant and they won't have those kind of problems 
So the whole new heart thing came about a few months ago when people in the dreamer community were trying to say that I wasn't saved because I only believe the gospel with my mind and not with my heart, which is totally untrue and in t and impossible because the mind, the understanding is in the heart. And we proved all that scripturally. They ignored it. Um, and they were making this distinction between heart and mind, heart faith versus mind faith, which is the same thing MacArthur does. The Calvinists do that. They say it's not enough to just understand the facts of the gospel. You have to, quote, believe it in your heart. Well, what does that look like? Well, you'll, you'll know by the fruit. And they proved at that point that they didn't believe the gospel. And yet they are associated as being the grace community. You know, that's what's ridiculous. And people are listening to them. Uh, they don't even have the gospel right. But they base all that off the idea that we're under the new covenant. And they insist that they have a... The reason they're offended is because they say they love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they got mad when I did messages against the Lordshippers last year that said, no, you don't. And uh, they said, yes, we do. And they based it off the, their understanding that they believe they're under the new covenant. And they are the perfect example of how believing you're under the new covenant eventually leads you to backload works into the gospel. They were already backloading works into the gospel. They already didn't believe it, but now they've fully exposed it in all of their doctrine. And not only have they openly rejected the gospel, uh, but they also are openly rejecting dispensationalism and Israel's return to the land and the distinction between the church and Israel, which is ironic because the only reason their channels exist is because all the rapture dreams they're having. <laughs> so they've just cut themselves off, you know. Now I pray that some of them repent. You know, if they're genuinely the Lord's, they will hear him. They may have an accursed gospel and still be believers. You can do that. You can get so offended that you become so unclear about everything that you no longer even can articulate the gospel and yet you're still regenerated. Um, if you believed once, you believe. And you can't deny it. But you're building with wood, hay, and stubble. But in some of those cases, they're dealing with familiar spirits. They are not believers in any sense of the word. And yet, they're dressed up like Christians. And their fruit shows. They are divisive wolves. They're so full of anger and offense. Yet insisting they've got this new heart that loves God fully and loves his neighbor as the self fulfills the law it's so ironic it's just laughable and i have not used the word idiot or anything like that in these messages i've done but it's tempting let me tell you it is tempting because it's just like wow can't you see it's so obvious but the lord is doing all that um okay so then finally the last two things is our life is a heavenly life. We are to seek those things which are above. We are dead to this world. We are not to live as those who are of the world, but we are from our conversation is from heaven and we're looking to heaven for a blessed hope. The Israelites will live in their land, which God has ordained, and they'll live as those on the earth and of the earth. That's what's amazing is the Lord is going to recover the earth for them. And their spirituality is not going to be like we have, where we're walking according to something from heaven. Their king is going to be on the earth, and they're going to enjoy their inheritance in the land. We're dead to everything in this world. They get to live unto it. Now, that has to do with God changing the environment, but it also has to do with who they are. That's their inheritance. Our inheritance is in the heavens. Theirs is on the earth. And eventually it'll all be reconciled because the new heavens and the new earth will come and the new Jerusalem will come out from heaven onto earth and then we'll all be together. Uh, and we live for the building up of the body of Christ to become the fullness of Christ, and we've been talking about that. They live as a light to instruct the Gentiles. Their function in that time will be to train the Gentile nations in the ways of God. Uh, Isaiah 2, 3, many people should go up and say, come, let's go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways and walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
And then Micah 4, 2 is another one. Many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth from Zion. And this is their priesthood, in a sense. As a nation, they will be a light to the Gentiles, and the pe people will come to the light of their rising. It'll be glorious. And they will be rebuilding all the wasted cities that were burned and destroyed in the judgment. And there will be a wonderful kingdom, and we will be there too. Yes, reigning as kings, but remember, the greatest is the servant of all. So we will be serving. And I had a vision. I, the, I had a small inkling of what that might look like. I don't want to necessarily say a vision, but maybe. I was at an airport last year going to California, and I was in the bathroom. And I was standing at the thing, and all of a sudden, I had a strong thought in my mind of course there will be airports in the millennium. And I thought about it for a second and this little vignette played out right in front of me where I saw myself, I thought, you know, the mortals will have, they're, they're instructed, they have to go up to the, keep the feasts in Jerusalem once a year. If they don't, God won't send rain on their countries. So they will keep the memorial feast as a remembrance of what Christ did to teach the nations. Um, and they'll fly to get there. There will be modern technology. It'll be a super techno millennium. But I had a vision of myself, and I kept visiting this guy who lived to be like a thousand years old. And I knew him when he was a hundred or two hundred, and I visited him from time to time, and we were friends. And then I officiated his funeral. He died, and I actually was there to officiate the funeral. And I was one of the ones in resurrection, and he was a mortal living on the earth. And all of that flashed in my mind in about three seconds. It was really powerful. I'll never forget it. Was it a vision? I don't know. I haven't had many visions. I don't know what those are. But it sure was cool. And that's what we have to look forward to. It's going to be exciting. All right. Take care.